Good morning, everybody. Is that better? Excellent. Um, my name's Jessica Woodhams. I'm a forensic psychologist from the UK. I work at the University of Birmingham. And uh, I'm really delighted and grateful to the EAPL to give me a chance this morning to tell you about the field of crime linkage uh, and in particular how it's been evolving uh, just over the last decade. Um, as you can see from the title, uh, like Professor David Cook, I borrowed uh, part of my title from the title of the conference itself, from the point of view of from research to effective practice. Um, and the reason for that is because the term, I guess the phrase, of from research to effective practice is very relevant to me individually uh, from the point of view of this field of crime linkage, but it's also very relevant to the field itself. So, Personally, um, I used to be a crime analyst, um, and that's a civilian role within the police, and my main job was to conduct crime linkage, and this was in late, uh, 2000, early 2001 to um, late 2002. And back then, there really wasn't very much research at all uh, to support what we were doing in the area of crime linkage. Uh, and that's the reason that I actually left the police and moved into academia, was to try and make sure that crime linkage became an evidence-based practice. And so research was actually translating into effective practice. And that's been an aspiration that's followed me throughout my whole academic journey in this area and in other areas. Um, but also it's one that's shared um, by my international colleagues who also work in this field as well, so hopefully that will become apparent throughout the presentation to you. But for research to translate into effective practice needs two things. First of all, it needs researchers to be aware of how practitioners actually go about conducting crime linkage on a daily basis, so we have to understand their daily job and what they do. You still can't hear me. Is that better? Okay. <laughs> I was saying for research to translate into effective practice, um, there has to be two things in place. So as researchers, we have to have a good understanding of how practitioners go about conducting crime linkage on a daily basis. And by having a good understanding of what they do, we have to then design studies that are relevant and that mimic how they go about conducting crime linkage. Equally, practitioners have to take up our research findings, read what we've done, and actually put it into practice. And that requires a two-way dialogue between practitioners and academics. When I'm talking about practice in terms of crime linkage, really there's two main consumers of the research that we conduct. So there's people who work within the police, like crime analysts, so civilians within the police who are conducting crime linkage on a daily basis. There's offender profilers or behavioural investigative advisors, or there might be police psychologists in other jurisdictions. So they'd be the main consumers of this sort of research. However, crime linkage analysis also makes its way into legal proceedings. So another consumer of the sort of research that we do is going to be legal practitioners as well. So in the next 50 minutes, I want to explain to you whether crime linkage is or is not translating from research uh, into effective practice. And to do that, I need to do a number of things. So I need to outline to you what crime linkage actually is and how it's practiced in reality. I'll present a summary, and it is, really is a quick summary of the research that we've done over the last decade. And really importantly, explain the limitations of this research to you because it has an impact on whether it's going to translate into practice. And then also finally tell you about a new initiative uh, that I set up last year, which is the Crime Linkage International Network, which has been designed to bridge the gap between academia and practice. So what is crime linkage? It's an umbrella term for a related set of practices. So it involves the identification of crimes committed by the same offender as a result of their behavioural similarity and distinctiveness. But it's known by a number of different names. Like offender profiling, it has a lot of different names. So in South Africa and in the United States, it's quite often referred to as linkage analysis. In the UK, it tends to be referred to as comparative case analysis. It's also called crime linkage case linkage and behavioural linking. Now, researchers use these terms interchangeably, but practitioners actually make distinctions depending on the name you used in terms of what exactly they're doing. So in the UK, a distinction is made between comparative case analysis and case linkage. 
In comparative case analysis, you'd be analysing a group of crimes to see how similar they are to one another, and then you'd write a report at the end of that, usually for the police, where you'd say, there are these five crimes and they look similar to one another and they're actually quite distinctive from other types of this type of crime. So for example, you might have five rapes and you say these are all very similar, but they're quite distinctive from other rapes that I've looked at. But the report would stop at that point. You'd just point out the similarities. A distinction is then made between that and then case linkage where the professional actually gives an opinion as to whether the crimes are likely to be part of the same series or not. So although researchers use these terms interchangeably, practitioners don't and they do make this distinction. So I said it's an umbrella term um, and that's because it can be conducted in a number of different ways. So the police in quite a few countries have large-scale databases and Peter Van Koppen mentioned one of them yesterday which is ViClass, so the Violent Crime Linkage Analysis System. And within these databases the police record, um, for example, all stranger rapes that happen in a country or all stranger contact sex offences, all stranger child abductions and any murders that have some kind of sexual element. So within these databases, there's thousands, if not tens of thousands, of sexual offences, for example. And the police can use those databases and search them proactively. So that's one way that you could conduct case linkage or crime linkage, is you'd mine that database to see if you can find two or more crimes that look similar to one another, which are distinctive from the other crimes in that database. Another way that this can happen is the practitioner might be approached by the police with almost a ready-made series. So the police come to the practitioner and say, we've got these five stranger rapes and we think they're part of the same series. Can you have a look at them and give your professional opinion as to whether you think they are or not? So the practitioner is being given a ready-made series to analyse and give an opinion on. What's more typical is what I experienced as a crime analyst, which is where an investigating officer would come to me and say, I have this particularly nasty stranger rape. Could you search and see if there are any others? Because I think this might be part of a series. And so my job would be to look and see if there are any other similar crimes that suggest it's part of a series, and then provide a report to the police if I found some. The other scenario in which this can happen is the police might have a suspect for two or more crimes, or even one or two crimes, where they've linked that suspect to those crimes by hard physical evidence. So they might, for example, have DNA evidence that links that offender to those crimes, but they suspect that he committed more than just the ones they've got DNA evidence for. And so they ask the practitioner to, again, search and see if there are other crimes that look similar and they try and charge him and potentially prosecute him for all of them. So those are the different ways it can be conducted. Um, at the moment, I'm talking a lot about sexual offences, and that's because that's my background. But actually, this can be conducted with um, serial homicide, serial arson, robbery, burglary, car theft, many types of crimes this is actually conducted with. But it's quite often most formalised for sexual offences and serial homicides. There aren't any agreed international standards uh, for how crime linkage is actually practiced, um, but it is practiced in a lot of different countries. But I just wanted to outline the process to you quickly so you've got a, a rough idea of how it's conducted. So when I was a crime analyst, this is how I would have conducted it. And speaking to practitioners last week, this is how they still conduct it quite often. So if you have the scenario of the police coming to me with a particularly nasty stranger rate they're concerned about, the first thing that I'd say to them is, can you give me the case file on that crime? And I'd read it and reread it so I was very, very familiar with how that offence unfolded. Having done that, I'd construct a list of behaviours for what we would call the index offence, the offence that we've been given initially. And that would include things like, how did the offender approach the victim? Did he use a con approach? Uh, or did he suddenly grab the victim from behind and drag them into the bushes? Did he hit the victim? Did he use a weapon? How did he relate to the victim interpersonally? Was he, did he try and kiss them? Was he complimentary? All of those sorts of behaviours I'd be recording if they were present in the offence. I then search for similar cases, typically using a database and using those behaviours that I've coded as the basis for my search. And when I identify similar cases, I'd go through the same process. I'd request the documentation, and again, I'd go through each of those crimes and create a list of behaviours that are present in those crimes as well. 
Having done that, you end up with a matrix where you can see where there are similarities across the different crimes that you've identified, and also where there are differences. So where there are differences, as an analyst, you need to be thinking, were they caused by the situation? Did the victim, for example, really struggle in this particular offence, which might explain why the offender slapped her and he hasn't done it in previous offences? Or did a third party come along and interrupt the offence, which somehow changed his behaviour? So you'd be looking at the differences and think, can I actually explain these by the situational variation? With regards to similarities across the crimes, you can't just say, well, these crimes share this same behaviour. You have to go back and think, well, is that behaviour common or rare within this crime type in general? So within stranger rapes, if the offender kissed the victim in all of the offences that I've identified, I'd need to think, well, how common is kissing? If it's quite rare, then that's quite strong evidence that these crimes were committed by the same person. And you wouldn't just look at individual behaviours to see whether they're common or not. You'd look to see, OK, we've got five behaviours that are shared across all of these crimes. And then you'd look to see how common is that actual combination uh, when we look at rapes, for example, in general. Having done that, you'd then write a report for the prosecutor or for the police, which would explain where you've found some similar crimes and potentially give an opinion as to whether it is a series or not. Now, whichever way you conduct crime linkage, the assumptions underpinning it are exactly the same. So whether we do it proactively or reactively, the assumptions are identical. So the first one was articulated by Professor David Cantor in 1995, which is the offender consistency hypothesis. So for crime linkage to work in practice, offenders have to show some degree of consistency across their offences. But also to be able to distinguish, let's say, Bob's stranger rapes from Peter's stranger rapes, Bob and Peter have to commit their offences slightly differently from one another. So there also has to be a degree of distinctiveness. So these two assumptions both have to be supported for crime crime linkage to work in practice. So I mentioned to you at the beginning that I was a crime analyst from early 2001 until early 2002. And thinking about whether crime linkage analysis was an evidence-based practice back then and, and how it's changed over the last decade. As I said, back then there really wasn't much evidence to guide our practice at all. Don Gruben and colleagues had conducted a study about linking serial sexual offences and they'd published their interim findings in 1997 and then they'd also published their full findings in 2001. So we had that paper. Um, there were also some papers written by my manager at the time, Anne Davies. She was actually a forensic botanist, um, but she'd studied stranger sex offences, and she'd been looking at how rapist behaviour changes over time. So we had some idea about the reasons why you might see variation in behaviour within a series. But my training, I actually trained at the University of Kent, uh, where I did my MSc in forensic psychology, where it was very much drilled into us that as a forensic psychologist, your practice should be evidence-based. And I felt very uncomfortable with the idea that I could end up in court giving testimony about crimes being linked and being part of a series without really having much research to back that up. And as I said, that's what prompted me leaving academia uh, and move, sorry, prompted me leaving the police uh, and moving into academia to pursue this line of research. At the time, uh, which was around 2002, I think two other significant things happened which set the agenda for Crime Linkage research really from that point forward until today. One of them was a paper written by Lawrence Allison, uh, Craig Burnell, Andreas Mokras and David Ormerod and it was actually a critique of offender profiling rather than Crime Linkage itself. Um, this was published in Psychology, Public Policy and Law and it outlined the assumptions that underpin offender profiling and it critiqued them very much saying that actually there really isn't very much research at all to support the underlying assumptions of offender profiling so thereby questioning whether it would work in practice at all. They said that the research was lacking for most of the assumptions and I've included a quote from them there so they were saying that there was some, although limited, evidence for the consistency assumption, which also underpins crime linkage. So offender profiling and crime linkage both share the assumption of consistency and distinctiveness. So they were saying, yes, there is some evidence, but it's not particularly good. They also highlighted how offender profilers were using quite outdated models of personality in terms of thinking about how personality might produce behaviour. 
and so how the person produces behaviour and how your personality and your traits influence the behaviour that you show at a crime scene. And they critiqued it and said, you know, actually modern day theories of personality and of behaviour recognise that it's not just about the person's individual characteristics producing behaviour, it's about how those interact with the situation itself. And they were saying, you know, profilers were not taking account of the role of the situation and how the situation interacted with the person in producing behaviour. So although this paper was a critique of offender profiling, it was also very much a critique of crime linkage as well, because crime linkage also wasn't thinking about how the situation might impact on offender behaviour, certainly not from a research point of view. And as I said here, it also indicated that there really wasn't very much evidence at all to support a fundamental assumption of crime linkage. So for, I think for me and my colleagues who've been working in the field since, this paper really underscored for us the importance of actually dedicating time and effort into testing these principles and making sure that they were valid. Also in 2002, Craig Bennell and David Cantor published not the first study uh, on linking crimes, but actually quite a pivotal study. They were looking at linking burglaries, um, and they were really the first to clearly articulate what the assumptions underpinning crime linkage are. Um, they also introduced uh, what was then a new methodology uh, for testing the crime linkage assumptions, which since then has been adopted by a number of people in the field and has become a very standard method for people to use. They also used personality psychology theory to make the point that in crime linkage, it's wrong to assume that all behaviours are going to be useful in linking crimes, because they made the argument that some behaviours are going to be influenced by the situation a lot more than other behaviours. So they gave the example in burglary and they said, burglars have a lot of control over where they choose to commit their offences and how they um, enter the building, for example, but they don't have a lot of choice over what property they're going to steal once they're in that house, because it depends on what property's there. So property stolen as a behaviour is very much open to situational influence and so it won't be as useful for crime linking. And so it highlighted, I think, for everybody that we need to also examine the individual behaviours and see how useful they are for linking crimes. A couple of other things were happening at the same time in the practitioner world, which also impacted on how research has developed in this field over the last decade. So just to give you one example, this is the case of Stephen Fortin versus the state of New Jersey. So the initial trial of Stephen Fortin was in 2000 and then he had two appeals after that. So just to give you some background to the case, Stephen Fortin had already been charged and convicted um, of the rape and attempted murder of a police officer, a female police officer, in the state of Maine in the United States. When he was convicted of that, the New Jersey police noted similarities between that offence and an unsolved crime that they had in their jurisdiction, which was the murder of Melissa Padilla. So there were quite a few similarities in behaviour between the two crimes. And so this police in New Jersey wanted to charge uh, Stephen Fortin and convict him of the murder of Melissa Padilla as well. So this went to trial, and at the trial there was evidence of uh, similarity in bite marks between the two victims. There was also some DNA evidence uh, suggesting that Stephen Fortin had been at the crime scene of Melissa Padilla's murder, but it was um, what you'd call transferable DNA. It was on a cigarette butt, and so he argued that it would, could have been walked onto the crime scene itself. And then there was also behavioural evidence of similarity between Melissa Padilla's murder and the attempted murder of the state trooper. So Stephen Fortin in the original trial was actually convicted and sentenced to death. Um, he then successfully appealed it uh, and during the appeal the linkage analysis evidence was rejected by the courts on a number of grounds. So the courts used a legal standard called the Dober criteria to assess the linkage analysis evidence that the FBI presented. But they rejected it and said that crime linkage or case linkage at the time was not sufficiently reliable, which means that there wasn't sufficient evidence for the assumptions that underpin uh, crime linkage analysis at that time. And also there wasn't a lot of research on the methods that were being used. Weirdly, the courts also decided that only Hazelwood, who is the gentleman that gave evidence, that only he and his peers actually conducted this which was very odd, bearing in mind it's conducted in a lot of different countries across the world and was the same at this time as well. And they also said that it hadn't been subject to peer review, so those are the grounds on which it was rejected. 
the same time, just before these decisions came out, um, myself, Ray Bull and Clive Holland were really inspired by an article that we read which had been written by Aldert Vry, who's going to be speaking later. Um, Aldert had been looking at statement validity analysis and comparing it to the Dobert criteria to see whether it held up against this standard. And so we decided to do the same with crime linkage analysis as well. So these are the criteria for the Dobert standard. So the underlying theory of the practice that's being presented in court and the methods that have been used by the practitioner have to be testable and they have to have been tested and shown to be reliable. So those are the two assumptions that I was referring to. So yes, we concluded that you can test the assumption of consistency and you can test the assumption of distinctiveness, but our feeling at the time was that the research evidence didn't really 100% support those two assumptions. So what we were seeing was that offenders show a degree of consistency and distinctiveness, but they're not perfectly consistent and distinctive, which means you're going to make mistakes when you're doing this sort of practice. Another question is, has the hypothesis or technique been subject to peer review? Well, at the time when we wrote this chapter, yes, it had been, because there were quite a few papers that had been written about the assumptions and also about the methods as well. One of the other questions for Dober is, is there a potential, is the potential error rate of the method known? So do you know how often you get it wrong? Or do you know how often the theories that underpin this practice don't apply in reality? And at the time of writing this, no, we had to conclude that we couldn't, couldn't actually say yes to this question. We really didn't know what the error rate was for crime linkage analysis at all. And then finally, is the theory on which the hypothesis and technique base generally accepted by the scientific community? And at that time, we again concluded not yet. Although there had been publications on crime linkage and its assumptions, we didn't really feel that at that time everybody was in agreement that there was support for the assumptions or even agreement about how it should be conducted. Whether crime linkage can be considered to be a form of evidence-based practice became very relevant in the UK last summer. Uh, and this was to do with a preliminary hearing associated with the appeal of a man called Thomas Ross Young in Scotland. Um, and his appeal is referred to as Thomas Ross Young versus Her Majesty's Advocate. So just want to add at this point that I'm not divulging any information to you now which isn't in the public domain. Uh, and if any of you want to read any more about this case, let me know and I can give you the web link for it. So just to reassure you, this is all in the public domain already. So Thomas Ross Young was convicted of the murder of Francis Barker in 1977, um, and he's been in prison ever since 1977. Um, he appealed his conviction very recently uh, on the basis that the, there had been a subsequent crime linkage analysis which had linked Francis Barker's murder to another group of murders that happened in Scotland around the same time but he was actually in police custody when those other murders happened. And so he was arguing that because crime linkage analysis was saying that Francis Barker's murder was connected to a whole series of other murders and he couldn't possibly have committed those other murders, that he was therefore innocent. So case linkage analysis and its reliability was really very pivotal uh, in his appeal. So both Professor David Cantor and I were involved in this appeal. Uh, Professor David Cantor was the expert witness for the appellant and I was the expert witness for the respondent. Um, and my own involvement in this case started in 2009 when the Crown Office in Scotland asked me if I could pop up to Scotland and just tell them a bit about crime linkage analysis, which seemed a very innocuous request at the time, which then developed into could you write a report from us, for us and then recently could you come and be an expert witness for us. So the issues that were covered in this hearing were very similar to the issues that were covered in the Fortin case as well. And that's even though the Dobert criteria don't actually apply in Scotland, it still seemed that the courts were using them as a guide. So the sorts of things that were asked during the trial were about what are the validity of the case linkage or crime linkage assumptions? Have they been tested? Does the research suggest that all offenders are consistent and distinctive? Do we know if there are offenders that aren't consistent and distinctive? Do we know what the error rate is? So they were asking us, are there studies of practitioners and how accurate they are, so we know how often they're gonna get it wrong? And also they wanted to know whether there were any international standards in place for crime linkage analysis. 
Having discussed all of that with the court, both myself and Professor Cantor, the court concluded in the end that it just wasn't admissible. They recognised that actually it could be valuable in, in advising police investigations, but they didn't feel that it was useful for the court at this time. And the research on crime linkage, I think, played a really pivotal role in this decision. And so I will now move on to actually telling you what we've been doing for the last 10 years. Well, 10 years and more. <clears throat> so there's more than a decade of research has happened since those critiques were written by Lawrence Allison and colleagues and since that paper by Craig Bennell and David Cantor introduced a new method for investigating these assumptions. What I'm hoping to show you here, and I can't promise that the total figures are completely accurate because we haven't done a systematic literature review yet, but this is just to give you an outline, is show you how the interest in this area has really grown over the last decade. Also to show you that there's quite a range of crime types that are now being investigated from the point of view of their assumptions, but also to show you that there are some crime types that are still really quite neglected. So arson, for example, doesn't get looked at very often, and robbery, for example, doesn't get looked at often, whereas homicide and rape and burglary in particular get a lot of attention. So what do we know? There's a number of different methods that are used for testing the assumptions of crime linkage. One of them is where you create from your sample of crime series linked and unlinked crime pairs. Linked crime pairs are two crimes that have been put together which are committed by the same serial offender. So if the assumptions of crime linkage are correct, those sorts of pairs should be characterised by quite high levels of similarity. They should be very similar in behaviour. And you also pair together unlinked crime pairs, and that's where you put together two crimes that were committed by two different offenders. So the theory of distinctiveness would suggest that when you put the crimes of two different people together, that pair should be characterised by behavioural dissimilarity. So the linked crime pairs should be similar to one another in behaviour, but the unlinked crime pairs should be dissimilar to one another. Once you've done that, you can use statistical methods such as logistic regression or discriminant function analysis to see how accurately, based on behavioural similarity, you can distinguish between the linked crime pairs and the unlinked crime pairs. Or you can also look and say, OK, if I take this crime out of the data set and I look at how similar it is to all other crimes in the data set, because linked crime pairs should be very similar to one another, what I should be able to do is rank list all the other crimes in that database, and the ones at the top of that list should be the ones that are most similar to the one I'm interested in, and they should be part of the same series. So you can try and predict which series a given crime belongs to from your data set. So those are the two main approaches that researchers tend to use. So in terms of what we found, what you'd hope to find is that linked crime pairs would be much more similar in behaviour than unlinked crime pairs, and we have found that. So we found that in terms of modus operandi, so how the offender actually commits the offence, in terms of how close together they are in space and also how close together they are in time. We've also been able to use behavioural similarity to attribute crimes to the correct series with reasonable degrees of accuracy, not perfect by any means, but certainly better than what you could achieve by chance alone. And also, we can distinguish linked and unlinked pairs from one another with moderate to excellent levels of predictive accuracy. So all of that's quite positive in terms of the assumptions that are underpinning crime linkage, which the courts, as I've outlined, have been very interested in. The problem is that when you actually look at the samples that we've got, within the samples there are some serial crimes which are characterised by complete inconsistency. So we know that these two crimes are committed by the same person, but they're completely dissimilar to one another. So in practice, you can't rule out that you're going to make false negatives and these kind of mistakes. Also, we know that two crimes in our data set were definitely committed by two different offenders, but they look perfectly similar to one another. So again, you're going to wrongly attribute crimes to a person who didn't commit them, potentially. When you break down the crime types into serial acquisitive crime and serial interpersonal crime, you also find differences. So in terms of the behaviours that are useful for linking, they're not the same depending on crime type. So for serial acquisitive crime, and by that I mean things like burglary and car theft, what you tend to find is that the um, distance in space, so the spatial proximity, of the crimes is one of the most useful linking factors. 
And that's the idea that offenders don't travel very far to commit offences, so they commit their offences close together. And that seems to hold out across um, both car theft and burglary. Also, how close together the crimes were committed in time is also a useful linking factor and both of those tend to outperform traditional modus operandi so how the offender entered the house how they entered the car the kind of car they picked or the kind of house they picked time and space outperform traditional modus operandi in terms of serial interpersonal crime, so this is homicide, rape and robbery, you see the opposite. You see that modus operandi behaviours are useful. So in particular, how the victim or the witness was controlled during the offence, so was a weapon used, um, how did the offender instruct the victim to do things. Those sorts of behaviours are useful for linking interpersonal crime. Uh, any kind of sexual behaviours that the offender engaged in seem to be more useful. And also planning behaviours, so how did they plan their escape? Did they use a condom? Did they wear a disguise? All those kind of things are actually useful for linking crimes as well, if you're looking at interpersonal crime types. The kind of behaviours that you might think would be useful, so the sorts of behaviours that are referred to as style behaviours, these are things that are supposed to represent the motive of the offender. So things like uh, the offender complimenting the victim, so a pseudo-intimate sort of rapist. Um, or a very hostile rapist, so somebody who demeans the victim or spits on the victim. All of those behaviours aren't necessary to commit the offence, which is why they're called style behaviours. So you would think that they'd be useful for linking crimes, but actually they're not. Quite often they perform worse than chance. But an important caveat there is, again, when you look at the data itself, you find that some serial offenders are really consistent in their style behaviours, and some of them are completely inconsistent. So you wouldn't necessarily want to rule them out and, and not use them. So in terms of why this might be, there's several hypotheses. So why does intercrime distance and temporal proximity work really well for serial acquisitive crime? One option is that actually they're quite objective behaviours to code. It's quite easy to record in police databases accurately where a crime occurred and when it happened, whereas having to interpret somebody's behaviour, you know, how they selected a car or how they selected a house is much more subjective. And so that might be one reason why it outperforms modus operandi. In terms of, um, I think, both intercrime distance, temporal proximity, um, probably control behaviours and also planning behaviours, all of those behaviours are behaviours that the offender has quite a lot of control over. So the offender can decide when and where to commit their offence. He can engage in planning before he commits the offence and, for example, bring a rape kit with him to the crime scene. All of those behaviours happen before the offence and so the offender has quite a lot of control over them and they're not influenced by the situation so much. That might be another reason why they seem to perform quite well. Also, personality and social psychologists, when they're looking at how behaviour is produced and how your personality interacts with the situation in producing behaviour, they talk about there being a hot personality system and a cold personality system. And the hot personality system produces automatic emotional behaviours, so behaviours that aren't mediated by your thoughts. And again, it might be that some of the sexual behaviours and some of the control behaviours are automatic behaviours, and that might be why they're more consistent and why they're more useful for linking. Another thing to tell you is that these findings actually vary by country, they vary by um, police jurisdiction in the same country, and they also vary in effectiveness depending on if you're trying to link crimes across an entire force, or if you're trying to look more at a local level within a force. So, they do vary quite a lot and it's important to be aware of that. So when we were in court, we were outlining all of these findings to the court, but we also were discussing a lot the limitations of this research. So this takes me back to the idea of, does research translate into effective practice in this field? So we've got some support for the principles of behavioural consistency and distinctiveness, but we're not seeing perfect consistency and we're not seeing perfect distinctiveness. So it means that mistakes are going to be made in practice but there are considerable limitations to what we've done. So just to give you some examples, we use quite small sample sizes because it's quite hard to get these sorts of samples from the police. So I'm talking about us looking for crime series within samples of maybe 100 to 200 offences. Whereas, as I said earlier, the police are looking for crime series within databases which have thousands or tens of thousands of crimes that they're searching. So that's a problem. There's also a big mismatch between the way that researchers investigate these assumptions and where we make predictions about whether a crime belongs to a certain series or not, compared to how the practitioners do. So I outlined for you at the beginning how, as a crime 
analyst, I conducted crime linkage analysis, and that really contrasts with the research where we're using statistical methods to make these predictions. So in reality, the human is making these decisions and these predictions, yet the research, it's statistical models that are making these predictions. And we don't know whether humans perform worse than the statistical models or better, potentially. The limited research on this at the moment suggests they perform worse, which would mean that they're not going to do as well as the statistical programs are doing. One of the major limitations as well is that our samples typically have consisted solely of serial offenders. So we've asked the police for a sample of, say, 50 stranger rapes that are crime series. What we've not asked for are, can we have 50 um, stranger rapes that are part of a series, and can we also have some one-off offences? So within the databases that the police are searching, they're not just searching within crime series, they're searching within crime series and one-off offences. So we don't know, again, if the findings are going to generalise to practice. One of the most significant criticisms, though, is the last one. Because when we're doing our analyses, we need to be confident, or as confident as we can be, that these five offences belong to one offender and these four belong to a different offender, we usually rely on conviction status to know that. So we sample convicted crime series. And I know that won't sit well with some of you in the room because of miscarriages of justice and because we know people do falsely confess to offences as well. But that's, that's the best we can do. The problem with that is that when we're looking at convicted crime series, we don't know whether these offenders were caught, arrested and convicted because they were highly consistent and distinctive, which made them easy to catch. And that means that any findings that we generate on, on samples like this might not generalise to practice when you're trying to apply this to unsolved offenders who haven't yet been caught. So that's one of the major criticisms at the moment. So with these limitations in mind, this is what we've been trying to do to address them. So back in 2007, Ray Ball and Clive Holland and myself were thinking about this problem of using convicted series. And what we suggested at the time was that one option was to sample unsolved but linked by DNA series. So we know that they're linked to one another by DNA, but we don't know who the offender is. And it took us until 2012 to get access to such a data sample. Uh, and we were really lucky to work with the South African police who helped us get a sample of DNA linked offences that were unsolved. So we had 22 series representing 119 rapes. So you can see what I mean about sample size compared to the databases the police are using. Nine of those series were first linked by DNA and the remainder of them were first linked on the basis of similar modus operandi. So it gave us a chance to address this limitation. Are those that were first identified as a series based on similar modus operandi actually behaviorally more similar than those that were first linked on the basis of DNA? And they were, but only marginally so. So that was quite reassuring that that's perhaps not such a significant limitation as we thought it might be. And what we found, again, is more support for the assumptions underpinning crime linkage with, the, with this more realistic sample. So we found that the linked and the unlinked pairs could be distinguished with an excellent level of accuracy, but again, not perfect accuracy. This is another study that we've recently conducted as well. So this is one where we've been able to include one-off offences in the sample. <clears throat> when I wrote my PhD uh, in 2008, I was quite concerned about the fact that we weren't including one-off offences. And the reason for that was that if serial rapists, for example, are highly consistent and distinctive in their behaviour, when you use the methodology of creating linked and unlinked crime pairs, the linked crime pairs are going to look very similar to one another. And the unlinked crime pairs are going to look really dissimilar to one another because these guys are offending in a very different way to one another. So you're going to artificially make the linkage task a lot easier than it is in reality. And so at that time I was saying we need to include one-off offences in our sample. So we were able to do this here and actually see whether one-off offences make a difference when you include them in the analysis and, and then when you take them out. So we had 50 UK serial offenders, sex offenders, and 50 one-off offenders and their offences, so 194 offences. Still a small sample, but better than normal. Again, the linked crime pairs were significantly more similar in behaviour than the unlinked pairs, and that held even if you included the one-off offences. So that was good news. And again, the linked crime pairs could be distinguished from the unlinked pairs with an excellent level of accuracy, even if you included the one-off offences. But what we did see was a drop in performance once you include the one-off offences. It was only slight, 
But if you think at the minute, we've got 50 serial offenders and 50 one-off offenders. In reality, that ratio is going to be very different. You're going to have a lot more one-off offenders in the databases that the police are using than what we've got there. And so what we don't know at the moment is when you increase the ratio of one-off offenders to serial offenders, whether that performance really does deteriorate a lot. Uh, so that's something that we're going to be looking at. So all of this, I think, is a move in the right direction. Uh, but there are still problems, and one of the problems remains is these small samples. In particular, if you want to include unsolved but linked by DNA offences, there's not many of those in each country. So to be able to investigate or conduct a really robust test of these assumptions, you've got to bring together data sets from lots of different countries. And that's what we're planning, well, that's what we're doing at the moment. So we received a grant in 2003. I put an application into the Leverhulme Trust, which is a UK charity, and they funded us for two years to set up an international network of expert practitioners and researchers interested in crime linkage, which is called the Crime Linkage International Network. So our aim is to try and make linkage analysis um, an evidence-based practice. Um, another aim was to have face-to-face -face meetings because these expert practitioners and researchers are spread all over the world. We never really, occasionally at EAPL, but we rarely actually get together to be able to talk to one another <clears throat> and take this field forward. So hopefully we wanted to get funding for that. And we also were very aware that the research we've been doing was focusing very much on the assumptions because that's what the courts were interested in. But we didn't really feel that our research was meeting practitioners need and so we wanted to draw up a research agenda for the next five years with our practitioner colleagues so that it was actually the research was going to result in effective practice so we've got members from seven different countries we've got uh, the UK Finland Belgium the Netherlands South Africa Canada and the US and we've got pretty much an equal spread between researchers and practitioners so I just want to put a slide up there so you can see all of our different members who are involved so you've got myself and Amy Burrell, who's our network facilitator from the UK, Gerard Labascagni from the South African Police Service, Craig Bennell from Canada, Tom Pakkanen and Pekka Santilla from Finland, Matthew Tonkin from the UK, Jasper van der Kemp from the Netherlands, Gabrielle Salfati from the US, Lee Rainbow and Mark Webb, both practitioners from the UK, and then I haven't named the other people here because I haven't got their permission. But we've got the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, the Finnish Police, the Dutch Vi-Class Unit and the Belgian Vi-Class Unit. And we've had approaches from other countries to be involved, but we don't have funding at the moment to include them. Um, but we're making sure that they stay up to date with what we're doing. What we've done so far with the money we've been given is set up a website. So the web address is there for you if you'd like to find out more about what we're doing. And you can also see profiles on each of the different network members and also learn more about the projects that we're conducting. We're having three face-to-face -face workshops over two years where we get everybody together in Birmingham. Not the most exciting of locations, but it's nice to all get together a couple of times over two years. We've got two collaborative projects, so we're pooling data sets across the different countries so that we can make sure we have a good sample of unsolved but linked by DNA cases and we're also including one-off offences in our samples. So we're doing an assessment of the principles that are underpinning crime linkage with the most ecologically valid sample we can possibly gather. And we're also, across that list of different people, the academics have very different areas of statistical expertise and within the field itself there's a real mix of statistical methods that are used. So by bringing everybody together, we can actually compare these different statistical methods to see which ones are most useful for practice. So we're doing that as well. We're writing a five-year research strategy. I'm hoping we'll write some minimum standards for practice because that's lacking at the moment. And we're going to have a future dedicated conference for crime linkage as well. So in terms of the progress, we've had two of our three-day workshops in the UK already. And this is a quote from one of our practitioner colleagues following the first workshop, which was... I think produced mixed emotions for me. It was disappointing to hear it, um, but it was also positive to hear it in that having these workshops was the right thing to do. So what he said was that we'd made more progress in the last three days than we had in the last 10 years, um, which is a bit disheartening to hear, I guess, in one way. But at these workshops, we've agreed a list of pressing research questions, and that's what the practitioners have said they really need to know. 
They've also done demonstrations um, to one another and to the academics showing how they conduct linkage in practice. And that's been really useful because we assumed they did it in the same way. They assumed that they were doing it in the same way and they don't. So they've been learning from one another as well as the researchers learning from them. We've had a commitment to sharing very sensitive data across countries and that's been really challenging because this, as I say, it's very sensitive data. We are anonymising it before we're transferring it across international boundaries but there's all sorts of issues about um, how to store it, how we're going to transfer it. If a researcher is naughty and does anything, under what legislation are they going to be sued? All sorts of things like that we've had to discuss. <clears throat> We've also had data collection in South Africa, so South Africa didn't have an academic to help with the data collection, so I went to South Africa for, South Africa for two weeks and Amy went to South Africa for eight weeks to help collect a data set over there and she also went over to Finland to assist with the collection of the data from Finland and we've got two initial specific analyses per country that have been completed so as well as doing a, an across country study where we're pooling the data sets we're also producing research findings specific to each country which is what the practitioners need. So I guess going back to the beginning uh, is crime linkage resulting or is crime linkage research resulting in effective practice. The practitioners certainly see our research in their terms as basic uh, and therefore not directly applicable to what they do in practice but I think what we can tell them at the moment is that not all offenders show high levels of consistency so they shouldn't expect to see that. They all recognise that and they all recognise that their practice is not going to be 100% accurate. What we need to know I think is who shows consistency when do they show it and why? And I think the only way we're going to find that out is actually by talking to the offenders a lot more. And this isn't a new idea, this is something that Don Grubin suggested in 2001. So clearly we need to get on with it and start interviewing the offenders. The basic research is very important for legal decision making and so I think it's resulting in effective practice from the point of view that it is assisting legal professionals in making their decisions and it's cited by our practitioner colleagues in their court reports as well so they are utilising it. However, the question of is it actually directly changing the way that crime analysts conduct comparative case analysis and case linkage, the answer to that is definitely not yet. We have been looking at things like um, when we measure similarity between each pair of crimes in a data set, we use a statistic. Typically, we use Jacquard's coefficient, but we've been varying that, and you do see different results if you vary the statistic that you use. And that has implications for practitioners who want to automate the proactive searching of their databases on, for example, a weekly basis, because it means what similarity coefficient should they be using. So that research will certainly feed into practice. And where we're evaluating the different statistical methods using our international sample that we're gathering, we can also look at whether some of these statistical methods better lend themselves to underpinning structured professional judgment tools, which will help practitioners make these decisions in practice. So that's the end of my presentation, and I'm being very cheeky and taking the opportunity to advertise to you a forthcoming academic and practitioner collaboration. So while we've been working on the Crime Linkage International Network, at the same time we've been producing the first book on crime linkage, which myself and Craig Burnell are editing. But this book, I think, is quite unusual in that it's got a real mix of chapters contributed by academics who are leading this research, but also by the expert practitioners in the field. So just to give you another example of uh, effective practitioner and academic collaboration. But thank you for your attention. I think we've got 10 minutes for questions. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions? Mm-hmm.
Yeah. 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 So as a as a practitioner. Um, what you would ideally use are databases. So you'd calculate the base rate for a behaviour. So where, for example, I was given the example that a stranger rapist might kiss each of his victims in a series, you'd use a database of thousands or tens of thousands of cases of stranger rape to say, well, how often does that happen? Um, what you can also do is where, for example, you might have a combination of five behaviours across each of the offences that you've identified as a series, you can also calculate the base rate for that combination of behaviours. So that's, for example, what they do in the UK, but in a number of the countries they don't have such databases. So South Africa doesn't have a database like that, and the likelihood of it having one is very slim because the volume of serial rapes that they have is phenomenal. Um, and so, and also when I was an analyst, we didn't have a database that had the facility to do that. So what we had to do was we would have a weekly meeting where we would sit down and discuss the similar behaviours we'd identify. And as a group of people with varying levels of experience, so I, for example, had about two years' experience, but there was another analyst with about 12 years' experience, we would say, how often do we think this happens? And we'd guess what the base rate was, which is, in my view, not an acceptable way of doing it, but that's what we had to do at the time. Mm -hmm. I'm sure many of us uh, work in these areas provide the need to be able to collaborate with the police and are managing it successfully. Can you have any advice for us how we could better link up with the police forces? I can't hear you 100% because of the feedback, but I think you were saying, is there any advice for working effectively with the police? Yes, I Yeah. Uh, yeah. Need to, to, to uh, get in contact with police forces effectively with the recent Yeah. 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 Yeah, so I think we're quite lucky with our group that's within the Crime Linkage International Network. In the, I talk about academics and practitioners within the network, but it's a bit of a false dichotomy. So a lot of the academics have actually worked as practitioners, and vice versa, a lot of the practitioners have at least a master's degree that they've done in investigative psychology or forensic psychology. So they're very open to research anyway. Um, within the UK as well, the serious crime analysis section, who I do a lot of work with, for the last 10 years, they've been putting out a call for research proposals, so they specify these are the research questions that as an agency we're interested in, and they invite researchers to submit research proposals. So I think in the UK there's a real appetite for an interaction between the police uh, and academia. And that's become even more so in the last year where there's a great drive now for evidence-based policing. So there's actually funding for police forces to engage with academics. Um, I think it helps if you've been a practitioner because the police perceive you as understanding the challenges that they're facing. I think they feel reassured that you understand that research isn't a priority for them and you also understand their concerns about sharing data with academics and losing the control over that data. So I, I really think that helps. Um, but I think going to things like conferences, so again in the UK the police have their own conferences uh, and we go along and, and present our research. We've also sought funding for research fairs. So in April I held a research fair at the University of Birmingham and we invited um, all the national police forces to come along and we had about 160 people including police and academics who came and we just created a it provided a forum where the academics could display their research and the police walked around and chatted to the academics so I think anything like that encourages um, collaboration between the police and academics and, and takes people out of their day jobs. That was the great thing with this grant that we've been given in that we can have the workshops because I think the police have an awful lot to do and as I said research isn't their priority but actually giving them the funding to get away from the office for a couple of days and take them to Birmingham well away from South Africa for example and the Netherlands and where they can focus on, on research and have the excuse of focusing on research for three days really helps. Thank you.